Welcome to What Matters Most. We are dedicated to educating the community about holistic, metaphysical, and spiritual topics. Each week, we discuss things that matter most in life, the things that are most important to you that may have fallen to the wayside. We are always centered on the idea of simplifying life, connecting with our neighbors, and following our true paths. Our mission is to empower you to live the life that you've always dreamed of living. We invite you to focus your life on what matters most. This is Kristen. Hey, this is Maria. From Experience Nirvana. Foundation. Foundation. And today is about spiritual evolution. Later on in the show, we're going to have um, Dr. Jean Ang. He has quite a, a background. He went to Yale and... Um, very, very intelligent person. Really brilliant guy that originally started out his career path as being a neurobiologist uh, trained in Yale. And then he became part of the shift based on some um, healing modality that he was intimately involved with in out in the California area. Right. So what we kind of like to talk about and kind of throw out there today to the audience is about spiritual evolution and what it means to us and uh, you know, I guess a good starting point. I don't. You know, I guess a good starting point for me would be where did where do you feel that you, when did you be feel that your awareness started of uh, being involved with um, this kind of consciousness shift, like moving away from a viewpoint of or mindset of being more of a materialistic individual person, duality, as compared to being realizing that we're all intimately connected with each other. When would that awareness start? I when did that start for you? I think it probably was right around when we opened Experience Nirvana. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because once you kind of, once you have an, a, uh, an actual formal business in the holistic field, um, it puts you in touch with other holistic and metaphysical, spiritual, like-minded beings. And you start... It seems like it kind of opens the floodgates, and then all of a sudden you start going to expos and seminars, and you start learning, and, um... It's almost like an osmosis. I guess so. You like that? That was that's, really, that's brilliant a really intelligent yeah. word. Yeah. It almost threw me off for a moment. Yeah, yeah I'm going to just come up with it. <laughs> I'm not even sure if that word applies, but it sounds I like it might. I think it does. It might. It, like, it just happens. It, right. right. Through right. osmosis. That's good. Yeah. Scientific. See? And it, it all... You it might all have gone to Yale, too. I'm in another <laughs> lifetime. That's exactly it. I, I agree with you. It just kind of... It just seems begins. like it kind of happened. As soon as we went into this, it just kind of opened. And, and then every person you talk to in the field, you just you start finding more and more people who are becoming open to it. And you hear other people's viewpoints. And you just kind of start becoming immersed. And then it becomes a part of your life. And you realize there's more to life. Right. Well, I think we all sort of internally knew that prior. Maybe you did. I did. I, I'm kind of looking like out there gazing into the distance because, no, I actually have to say that probably for many years of my life, I think what was an aspiration, what to aspire for, were things that were on a more materialistic level. I don't know if you actually no. had that same mindset, but to me, um, what would, I don't know if I would have actually even connected with the terminology spiritual evolution. I was connecting with the terminology of prosperity and abundance and all of that being coming from a very financial standpoint right. and also materialistic standpoint. And that shift for me, as I have mentioned in numerous conversations, actually occurred when I started doing Reiki energy healing. And I actually expected that just to be something I would be involved with that was only on a physical level. I didn't realize that it had to do with um, spirituality, soul expansion, and all of that. Hmm. You know, I don't think I ever was only focused on financial needs, but I'm, I'm also younger, but I feel, I, I, I feel like, um, most of my adult life, I would say, has always been open to spiritual evolution, not focused on the money. I don't think I've ever... No, you've always been more on, on the, um, but viewpoint it might of, like, what, will, what is it that I can be doing with my life that will really give me, um, a happiness, sense of happiness and, and fulfillment. And fulfillment. I, I believe right. that I kind of veered off that path for quite a long period it of time. Happens. Yeah. But you're back on. I'm back on. And so I think part of the spiritual evolution 
and awareness is 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 knowing this the, the knowingness that is becoming kind of part of the collective consciousness yes i think it's becoming more widespread i think people are really starting to question what is it that i'm doing what is the relevance of what i'm doing and does that does yeah. that is what i'm doing really something that's fulfilling to me and is it is it what i want to leave behind i know right now there's a lot of people you hear of a lot of people um, making career shifts. Oh, absolutely. Total career shifts. I mean, shifts. I kind of, a part of me feels like it's not coincidence that all these people are getting laid off. Oh, no, because it, it, it's... I mean, it seems like, yes, yes we'll, 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 yes, we all know the economy is in, you know, dire streets and this and that, but I sort of feel like maybe on a higher level, it's, it's almost meant to be, mm -hmm. you know, so that it gives the people the opportunity of... You know, you you close one door, but you open a, a door to the path that you're supposed to be on. And maybe this will give people the opportunity. Yes, right now, you know, people are have lost their... You know, a lot of people have lost their jobs, and probably a lot of people are stressed out. How am I going to pay the bills, this and that, unemployment? But really, a lot of times, it just it paves the way to do what you're meant to do. And then in retrospect, in the end, you'll probably all look back and think... My gosh, if that didn't happen, you know, in the time, it mm -hmm. felt like I didn't know what I was going to do. But now I'm so happy that that happened because it put me exactly on the path of my destiny of where I was supposed to go. Absolutely. I can talk about that on a personal level. I know other people that also can speak about that on a personal level. Being more or less forced out of a corporate job in August of last year... That was really a very trying time frame for me. And I knew the change was going to happen. And we were already And you were involved. resistant. I was so resistant. Which is right? amazing because and we were already she, involved with the, with what, the event. We had, we, had, we, had, we had open experience Nirvana in 2008. So for the fact that still in 2010, you're struggling. You're struggling. You just did not want to cut the ties of the corporate it, world. And I think it's a really scary thing. Especially, I mean, you had decades in the corporate world, you know. So and I didn't like it. I hated you it. Hated Hated it with the so, that, so consciously, it didn't really make sense why she didn't want to. No, I it. kept saying to her, I, I just need like, one more year. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, you it's like, it was crazy. I just, I just need one more year. And it's like, why? They want to let you go and you'll get unemployment and severance. Just do it. And do it. Now, in retrospect, exactly what you just mentioned, I actually feel and have thought about this on numerous occasions and thought, my goodness, they, they gave me a gift. They gave me a gift. They, this was the best thing that they could have ever done because for me. Because I don't think if because they would have done that, me. You, I don't think, I think it would have always been, I'm just not ready. I'm, I'm just, not ready. It would, have been, it would have been a scary thing. Yep. It would have been a scary thing. So part of this spiritual evolution sometimes comes about in, There's if always, you're reluctant, right. it'll come about in a, in a way that maybe more or less forces you, kind of kicks you in the butt a little bit and makes you go, all right, you're not ready, well, we'll do what we have to. The thing that's right. wacky about that. And is that I do find in talking to other people that if you can actually create that shift on your uh, by yourself, on your own, it's a more gentle shift mm -hmm. as compared to one Being where for now <laughs> we've got to take the situation <laughs> under control, right. and you're not making that shift. Right. So we're going to have to help right. you with this. So, so I guess um, the key points here are realize that if you're in a in a bad situation and you're feeling down and out, and you don't know why, whatever or may be... unfulfilled. Right, or unfulfilled, and you don't know why this is happening for you. Realize that there might be a higher plan, a higher reason for whatever's going on for you, and good things are always coming. Absolutely, and this is your opportunity, think about this, to do what you really have a passion to do. Right, make the change And make your today. imprint on the world. Gene P is a PhD and has a healing practice based in California. He utilizes a number of healing modalities, including pranic healing, reconnective healing, the reconnection, shamanic healing, and vortex healing. In addition, he teaches a number of seminars that focus on the integration of science, spirituality, and healing. He travels around the United States facilitating healing sessions and workshops. He was actually formally trained as a neurobiologist at Yale University, which is quite an accomplishment. So welcome, Dr. Jean Ang. Hey, thanks for being here, Dr. Jean Ang. Oh, thank you, Maria and Kristen, and thank you for inviting me to speak on the show. 
Oh, wonderful. Let, let me ask you, um, Jean, such a shift that you made from going from this very left brain oriented field or direction into going into this whole metaphysical thing. So maybe you could share with our listeners a little bit of what inspired you to do that and why. Yes, uh, <clears throat> it's a good question. And a lot of um, people I meet, uh, clients or people at uh, different workshops or uh, uh, friends and family, I uh, ask the same question. Mm. And um, I think there's like two levels to it. One is I think there is already um, sort of a template or a trend that was going on. Um, if you look at a lot of the uh, popular writers in um, metaphysics or spirituality, a num number of them were either physicians or scientists who, mm. yeah, mm -hmm, who later on like uh, Norman Shealy, yeah. Uh, who is a neurosurgeon, right? And I think he has now his own um, school uh, that teaches um, sort of intuition and healing. Uh, Bernie Siegel, uh, a physician and surgeon, actually trained at Yale, uh, wrote a lot about um, the spirituality and healing side of uh, medicine and cancer survival. Um, and Joan Borisenko, so, um, who is a, actually a PhD from Harvard uh, in cell biology. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. So um, I think there was a, a trend that was going on. Uh, most of these uh, people, um, you know, made their shift, which was already going on, but I guess publicly uh, later on in their careers. And I think the only thing that may be happening now and me being personally part of that is that shift may be occurring earlier. Hmm. Uh, yeah, some people are, I think, staying in science mm -hmm. and finding ways to integrate uh, their work with spirituality. And if people are interested in that, that's usually um, in the field of meditation right now. I think there is a, a capacity to still stay in um, a very high level of science and um, integrate that with uh, sort of studying how the brain works in meditation. At least that's what I've seen. Um, the energy work, which is where I really, um, you know, fell into or embodied uh, completely as a practitioner, uh, that may take some more time just because of the paradigm uh, acceptance uh, by uh, traditional science, which doesn't have that in their paradigm, like an, an energy body. But uh, personally, um, the spirituality side of me was already continuing or going on um, well into, I guess, uh, college or even earlier than that in high school and uh, then into my graduate work. But the only thing is that it wasn't something public. And I think a lot of people are like that. And, oh. and that's just a choice. Yeah. And um, and then right around when I graduated from um, my graduate school, PhD, was when I began to train with uh, energy healers and sort of masters in the art and uh, that's when I began to make sort of that shift. And it was gradual, but still very quick in terms of perhaps over two or three years. That's an interesting statement that you made about the fact that maybe I'm almost feeling like maybe a lot of people that are scientifically oriented are perhaps actually also interested in what I would consider the metaphysical um, arena, but they're kind of doing it behind closed doors or maybe not on such a public level. Yes, Actually, if you um, actually, Ken Wilber has a book on um, very well-known physicists uh, who he writes about, or either um, writes about, or interviews, or actually takes excerpts from their writings. These are Nobel Prize winners. Wow! Uh, just as an example, and it's all their uh, mystical writings. Really? Yes. Uh huh. Um, I forgot the exact title, but Ken yeah. Wilber and uh, and physics and um, sort of mystical writings. If you search that on the internet, you the book will come up. I was looking on some of the information on YouTube, and I did see information on Dr. Norm Shealy. I did not realize that he had been a trained neurosurgeon, and that he had because he definitely is into the whole thing about um, empowering yourself and healing yourself and all of that. So that's that's quite amazing, Gene. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly, and, and uh, you know he worked uh, very um, closely with Carolyn Miss, the oh. uh, medical intuitive, uh -huh. and one of their first books, I think I was a freshman right out of college, I bought that summer was um, co-authored by, you know Norman Shealy and uh, Carolyn Miss, uh, I think it was maybe Creating Health or um, maybe even an earlier book of Carolyn Misses, and so uh, and now she's so you know really well known for her um, medical intuition and, and, and spirituality. 
So uh, I think there is a, a marriage between, uh, and this may be a different topic, between the medical uh, science and um, intuition, medical intuition, sort of that's bringing in the best, best of both worlds for health and healing. I think that's very um, inspiring, Gene. Uh, coming from a corporate background and working actually for years in a pharmaceutical industry, I had the experience of being exposed to a lot of people that were very brilliant, brilliant scientifically. And um, in, in discussions with them, there are many of them that would kind of be the naysayers to anything that you might, a topic that you might um Approach on a particular thing about you know healing yourself, energy healing, and all of that. But then also there was this other uh, group of people that were scientifically trained that actually were very open and receptive to it. And it was always one of the things that I kind of had a personal, um, I kind of hope that a lot of these people that had all of this brilliance could somehow combine it into this world of healing and how we could take advantage of that because it would be such a wonderful way to be able to to help the planet. But if you even think about it, hospitals are now in corp some at least mm, like you know, mm-hmm. like even um Hunter Medical Center I know there the nurses are actually starting to incorporate Reiki energy healing. Yeah. So that's that's really a, a great thing that they're starting to actually utilize these energetic levels of healing. Hey Jean, let's talk about our spiritual evolution our topic, the new direction of humankind. Mm-hmm. What is um what is the soul's evolution and is it happening to everyone? Right. Um, well, I, I can give you a sort of my sense, or and I would guess it would be considered an opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, I think uh, people are moving forward in, in some direction, and you know, coming from the scientific point of view, that would be a strictly uh, physical or materialist point of view, meaning it would be a, a physical evolution. Uh, what the title of the talk that I had given and what you just quoted, um, the soul evolution, may be more acceptable or more open for people to think about it as an evolution, not of the physical um, sense or form, but the evolution of consciousness or one's awareness or one's mind. Right. And, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, different spiritual traditions or different ways of thinking about that um, make that more expansive in the sense that it might not just include this one particular form or what I'm referring to as uh, reincarnation. Um, So the consciousness may continue after um, the form has sort of dissolved. Hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. So the idea would be, um, you know, you really cannot create or destroy what's already um, sort of in existence, but it would change its form. So consciousness could continue to evolve um, beyond um, just this one particular lifetime. So that's really, I think, the the bedrock of, of at least the opinion or framework that I'm coming from. Jean, did you also mention that there was a, phys- a physical evolution, or it, maybe I misunderstood? Yeah, the physical evolution is, I think, what I just kind of touched touched or made that a touchstone because that's sort of what we understand as evolution. Okay. What we're taught in, let's say, biology. And uh, that that would mean um, we're talking more of just um, you know a finite uh, length of time, and we're we're not talking more about the individual's evolution, more the species evolution. You know, when because when you were talking, I was starting to think about it from the as from the aspect of like physical meaning cellular. Um, those things that we, I'm hoping that we can talk about a little bit later on about the dot chromosome and all of that. So to me, that kind of changes the genetics of an individual, but not maybe necessarily on one on a visual level. Yeah, right. Yeah, and that, and that sort of, um, I think, a manifestation, um, the physical changes could be a manifestation of what I'm referring to as mm-hmm. the evolution of consciousness. Um, and, and I think um, that title of the talk and the topic of soul evolution, the focus of the evolution is really one of consciousness evolution rather than physical evolution. And you think uh, that this consciousness evolution has been going on for quite a while? Yeah, and I think in, in sort of answer to um, the sub-question you had of, of um, you know, is everyone going mm-hmm. through this evolution, uh, Within this framework, I would say yes, just because everyone has an awareness or they realize that they their consciousness exists and that this consciousness is learning continually, um, let's say this is con- considered this lifetime, uh, through le- life lessons and really 
um, constantly. So we're all changing, evolving, and, and I guess the bottom line is learning. Is that sort of like um, the, I don't know if you've heard of the, the 100 monkey theory? Oh, I'm not familiar uh, with that. Uh, yeah, that, that's... Um, that's on, a, so, on some level? Mm -hmm. and, and that's a beautiful concept that you brought up, and uh, one of the writers, a scientist, actually a scientist, his name is Rupert Sheldrake, to sort of explain that, that concept of the 100th monkey, which just for the listeners, maybe if that's not familiar, it's the idea that, um, you know, of a group of individuals uh, begin to learn something. Uh, at some point, uh, like say the hundredth person who learns it, it becomes um, knowledge, knowledge and usable knowledge for everyone in that group, even if they're not in physical contact with that group. Right, right, uh, just like a knowing. Oh, it becomes yeah, part like of the knowing. consciousness then. Right, like it's supposed to be yeah. like if... if if you teach a monkey something and then all of a sudden they others the other monkeys see them they they learn it but then monkeys on another island soon after a hundred monkeys they'll they'll actually just know it holy Moses. it becomes like just knowledge wow yeah exactly and th that other group of monkeys on another island was totally physically isolated from the first group exactly that, exactly right. i thought that was a really wild theory Mm -hmm. And I think that's really sort of uh, helpful in, in at least my understanding of this evolution of consciousness that, it, you know, it does affect the physical world. It, it's within, it's embodied in the physical world. But the idea is, uh, one implication is people who are, um, you know, moving forward in a way that may look, um, you know, peculiar to the norm, like, uh, like uh, Maria was mentioning, um, sometimes the energy healing is peculiar to the normal traditional medicine but at a certain point it becomes um, understandable or some knowing occurs um, on the entire societal level it doesn't require you know uh, one billion people to let's say study energy medicine for it to reach a, con a consciousness level where it becomes uh, normal mm -hmm. or, or somewhat um, acceptable it only takes um, a number of people who sort of maybe that's part of their soul calling or, uh, you know, evolution or that purpose um, for the rest of society to feel or, or understand what that's about. Hmm. So can you tell us a little bit about what is this vortex healing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so vortex healing, uh, it's called vortex healing, divine energy healing. Wow. It was started uh, by Rick Weinman, but for short, vortex healing. Uh, that's how it's sort of known. Mm -hmm. And um, he, he was a healer uh, for about 15 years in uh, Jin Shindo, which was a type of body work. But um, anyways, he was inspired by um, sort of a, a higher celestial being who kind of gave him this information about this particular energy modality. And uh, there's a number of practitioners around the world. And really, the um, there's probably two unique features, or, or one really unique feature is that it's... Um, it's teaching is a, or energy healing is um, what's underlying it is a process of awakening. And that means awakening from our limited sense of self or the kind of condensed form of our I uh, into sort of uh, a greater reality or sort of this oneness that we truly are. So the energy healing, which, you know, does heal on the physical, emotional and mental levels um, for this type of work, uh, does also have that what would be considered an awakening component, which I think has been popularized a lot by or more made more well known by Eckhart Tolle's book, uh, like The Power of Now. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, this healing has something to do with Merlin, doesn't it? Uh, yes, the divine being um, who contacted or who Rick Weinman was inspired by or, or downloaded with, with this information was um, the, the being Merlin and who's, um, who had a number of incarnations and one of the teachers of this lineage was in history was supposedly the Merlin that we know of in, um, from England. Right. Uh, yes, uh -huh, the British Isles. And... Um, mm -hmm. That's very interesting. That's really interesting. That's kind of cool, actually. Now, Jean, so you just explained to us what vortex healing, divine energy healing is. Now, that has something to do with the new dot chromosome, correct? Uh, yes, yes. There's, a, there's an offering within um, vortex healing that uh, practitioners can do uh, after a number of trainings. It's um, in, during the class called genetics, mm. uh, which allows the energies to work 
on the energetic component of the the genetics of a of a per, of a person a client and so the new dot chromosome is uh sort of imprinting a blueprint or so called energetic um genes or blueprints that uh supposedly humanity will evolve into and most of them or almost all of them have uh have to do with um consciousness so um so that's um, in a short what uh new dot chromosome is about Hmm. And so uh, I, as a person that would be interested in taking part of the new dot crom- chromosome technique, I, mm-hmm. do I need to have the vortex energy healing done first, or can I actually just opt to have the chromosome blueprint done? Yeah, that can just be done as a, a standalone session, um, sort of with a vortex healer who's who's had that transmission of, of that class genetics and so can sort of transmit this process. And it usually takes, um, you know, when I do it, it usually takes a uh, one day to sort of put in what's called the energetic blueprint. Uh-huh. It usually takes, uh, you know, somewhere around two sessions, which is about two hours. And then it, uh, you need to wait at least 24 hours to do what's called a second session, which sort of, um, and these are just energy, and these are energy sessions, but uh-huh. that sort of makes that blueprint more physical. It doesn't actually physicalize it, but we call it physicalization in the sense that it, it makes it more solid on the energy level. What if I don't do the second one? I, do I need to do the second one? Uh, the second one, it, for the process to be fully completed, uh, you do need the you second. You do? Okay. Um, yeah, mm-hmm, the second day, so so to speak. And why do you, why, it's tw- I'm sorry, did you say 24-hour gap in between? Yeah, at least 24 hours and up to 23 days. Oh, so it needs to be a minimum but no more than a maximum because mm-hmm. if you go beyond the 23 days, what happens? You, you kind of lose it, you, like you have yeah. to redo it again? Yeah, it doesn't you stay in re- there? Exactly. There may be some memory in the energy field, so uh-huh. things may go faster if you had to redo it. Um, it's usually not, you know, not a problem, um, but um, yeah, you just redo it. So if I was, let's just say, a person that was in my 20s, would Mm -hmm. I end up being, would I end up having this chromosome change occur in me on my own part of the consciousness changes that are happening on the planet? Or is this something that's really more applicable to a person that may be, um, have more years on the planet as compared to a younger person who maybe is just evolving to that point anyway? Um, it depends. Um, maybe not necessarily because you. Oh, uh, just to answer it on a couple levels. Um, some young people, even children being born now, they're if we take into consideration that their consciousness existed before they, you know, were born physically, right. are, are quite advanced. Mm-hmm. Maybe more advanced than than us. Than us, <laughs> so, right? Right. Um, so they they actually may not need this, but or in a sense, but um, oh. uh, as a joke. But uh, <laughs> okay, I got it. Uh, but uh, yeah, so it, the age wouldn't be um, too much as as much a factor um, as more as the um, if a person feels drawn to it at whatever age. Uh huh. So it'll always end up taking the person to another level, no matter what level they happen to be at. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Got it. Okay, so because we're all at kind of different stages. I mean, some of us may be in similar p- points of consciousness of, um, awareness, but others are, you know, be behind us, ahead of us. It really doesn't matter. That's really inter- I I find this whole um, thing that you do to be quite interesting because it's it's something that maybe um, talking from a person that comes from the East Coast, I have not heard of this being quite widespread. Yeah, I don't. I actually, I'm not sure. Um, I've actually seen it out from even a lot of the vortex healers. Although I know they can do it. Um, so uh, yeah, it, I was drawn to it because it reminded me uh, because of the evolution aspect, the consciousness evolution aspect. And just to give you an example, like um, there are twelve uh, genes, so-called blueprints, and they all deal with consciousness. So the uh, one of them is, you know, activating or uh, imprinting the uh, sort of development of the pineal gland um, oh, wow. or the pineal chakra, which is actually in the middle of the brain and, um, and energetically also. And uh, if you study a lot of different esoteric traditions or meditative traditions, um, you'll, you'll notice that they will teach about the pineal gland and focusing on it as a meditative um, area. 
that will help you to receive sort of soul information or divine information that actually comes in through the crown chakra. So, for example, if you imprinted that through the 12 blueprints, you sort of put that into the energy structure so you have those almost tools in your energy field already mm -hmm. that a normal person or a person who through a lot of spiritual discipline would have developed anyways or in the process of their own spiritual uh, practice. Gene, so that's how it the, works. Uh -huh. The pineal gland, is that located behind the third eye? Like so in that area? Yeah. I'm, I'm not, I'm would not, be, yeah, yeah, would that be the third eye chakra or would that be the crown chakra? Uh, it's actually the pineal gland um, physically and also energetically if you um, focus right in the middle of your head. Okay. so um, like, like down from the top of your head, like where the crown would be? Yeah, if you went, uh, if the sort of one axis was right down through the top of your head going down through your body, yeah. another line would be from one top of the ear to the other top of the ear. Okay. And then from the middle of your eye or, you know, your your two eyebrows to the back of your head, that would be the like third axis. Where those three lines meet in the middle of the head or in the middle of the brain, that's approximately where the pineal gland and the pineal chakra is located. That's very interesting. Oh, there's a chakra associated with it too. Yeah, there's an energy. It's an energy point also. Oh. Um, it's considered part of the third eye apparatus. The, the, um, from where I, what I've learned of the third eye, the third eye is not only sort of right at the forehead yeah. or between the eyebrow, but it's that plus it's like a tube, probably with the size of like a one dollar coin. That goes, I mean, in diameter, that goes from the middle of the eyebrow uh, back to the back of the head. Wow. So, and it, the middle of that passes through the pineal gland. Isn't that interesting? Wow. Wait. I've never that is heard crazy. of That's that. That's wild. Interesting. Talking about the pineal gland and uh, the pineal chakra. Jean, over time, I thought I had done some reading that our, that gland is small, Correct. Yes, that it is small. It's it's sort of a remnant of our retina, the retina that's in our eye. Oh, um, I as see. a physical yes, uh huh. Was it? Like, I don't know why, Jean. I thought I had read somewhere that at one point, um, that this gland was very was much larger and more highly evolved. Is that correct? Um, I've I've heard that also, and and that's probably true uh, in the sense that um. Well, I'll talk about it biologically a little bit and then maybe more spiritually or metaphysically. Yeah. It was, you know, considered, um, you know, evolutionary before we developed our retina, which is, you know, is our, the main sensing cells or, or organ of, of, of seeing. It was uh, primarily the pineal gland. And uh, that um, type of apparatus is still seen as the primary uh, visual sensing organ in frogs. Or amphibians. Hmm. So, um, so that's how it sort of developed, um, at least biologically. But um, it is uh, seen to be larger in people who, uh, you know, have meditated a great deal. Uh, oh. using that. Yeah, it, it can enlarge, or there's been studies on that. And um, so, uh, that may be both on a physical level, but definitely on an energy level. Um, for some esoteric writings, uh, usually uh, they'll say a person, a spiritual teacher will, um, if they have clairvoyant vision, will look at a, uh, a student or someone coming to them and see how activated their pineal gland is, meaning their the energy um, center at the pineal gland, not necessarily physically. Mm. And the more sort of activated it is, the more they can tell that um, sort of where they are on the spiritual uh, path. Wow. Mm -hmm. That so, is totally mm -hmm. amazing. I, you know, it's making me want to do more research on this because it's coming up more and more so. So obviously there's quite a relevance about that. Gene, the, the healing uh, modality that you're very intimately involved in, the reconstructive, can, reconnective healing, that mm -hmm. was the healing session that you, I thought you had mentioned that was what kind of opened up the floodgates for you. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, I, I would say that was um, one of the main ones. It was definitely, um, it, it made a, a sort of a quantum shift in both. Uh, sort of uh, my life as in, in the outer terms and also just in, inwardly um, in terms of consciousness. But that modality uh, is start was started by Dr. Eric Pearl, who's okay. a, who was a 
yeah, he's a chiropractor. Actually, oh. um, had a private practice in the Los Angeles area before he was activated with these um, healing um, energies or healing gifts uh, that people from his practice were beginning to spontaneously heal from when he would move his hands around them. And he had a process done that is very similar or to what is now um, being offered as the reconnection. Back when he had it done, it was called an accidental alignment. And that's what activated these gifts, these healing gifts in him. Uh, so, um, so when I had that done, it definitely, I was already sort of, you know, very drawn to the modality and to this particular healing energy. And it definitely helped me make, um, as a, just an example, uh, a change in my life, make my shift um, on many levels from the scientific uh, life or arena into the, you know, sort of full-time healing arena. Gene, just to give our listeners a little bit of a comparison, how is this healing different than maybe um, what I would consider like energy, uh, like Reiki healing? Uh huh. Well, um, I think they're they're similar in the sense that they would both be considered, um, you know, subtle energies or, or type of energy work. Um, there may be a difference in the sense that a lot of Reiki masters who end up taking, uh, you know, reconnective healing training do say that the, um, the uh, let's say, the flavor of energy is different. They know that oh. they're, you know, channeling or bringing through something that's different than uh, Reiki. So, um, and there's no real value judgment on that. It's just, um, it's kind of like knowing that you're tasting vanilla ice cream versus strawberry. And so, um, so there is some, um, it's a, you know, there's a qualitative difference to the energy. And, um, and then besides that, uh, it can be used, you know, both hands on. So a lot of people will integrate it within, let's say, their Reiki practice or another energy healing practice, or uh, a lot of most practitioners, uh, reconnective practitioners will do it uh, hands off, meaning just in the energy field. They don't actually need or they don't actually touch the physical body. Yeah, same thing with Reiki, and, you, and I'm mm-hmm. assuming that you can do this remotely too. And you can do it remotely too. 